Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Career Cert in UT Southwestern today. My name is Paula. I'm going to be your host for this webinar. Today, we will explore a very interesting clinical presentation of carbon monoxide toxicity, which was very it was rampant, rampant during the Texas winter storm of February this year. We will discuss the EMS clinical and operational implications that affect the care of this patient, and we will research opportunities for process improvement. I want to introduce you to our presenters today. We have Dr. Gil Salazar, Virginia Smith, Zach Caldwell, and Philip Jarrett. I'm gonna start with the fantastic Dr. Salazar. He is an associate professor of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern. He is a medical director of EMS education and oversees both initial and continued education of area EMS professionals. He practices clinically at Parkland Hospital Emergency Department and is board certified in emergency medicine and EMS. He also serves as core faculty for the emergency medicine residency and the EMS fellowship programs of UT Southwestern Medical Center. He's a creator of campus emergency preparedness and survival training, and his main goal is to improve the quality of education in the management of natural and human-made disasters. Now we have Virginia Smith. Virginia is a licensed, she was licensed paramedic for Cypress Creek EMS in Spring, Texas, which utilizes aggressive emergency protocols. She was working as the in charge paramedic position in ambulance teams responding to 911 calls. She received her bachelor's in biology from Texas A&M and her master's in biomedical sciences from University of the Incarnate Ward School of Osteopathic Medicine. She has been accepted to medical school, congratulations, and she had just started last month. We have uh, Zach Caldwell as well. He's a captain paramedic with the Allen Fire Department. He has worked as a paramedic for over 20 years and is also a full-time faculty member of Dallas College with over 15 years in EMS education. And now, last but not least, we have Philip Jarrett. Philip is a second year emergency medicine resident at Parkland Hospital applying to EMS fellowship. He received an undergraduate degree in molecular bio uh, biology and an MBA at Texas Tech University prior to attending medical school at UT Southwestern Medical Center. In his free time, Philip enjoys developing medical devices, bicycling with his miniature pincher in the milk crate, and playing Dance Dance Revolution. And just a quick note before we begin, we have included the slides as a handout that you can download. If you have any trouble doing so, just send me a quick note in the chat and I can send you um, the slides separately. Also, we will be taking questions throughout. So anything that you type in the question chat will be monitoring and answering. And uh, if you want to make a live question, just make sure you add the word live at the beginning of your question and we can go ahead and unmute your mic. Now with that, Dr. Salazar and team, after this long introduction, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Paula, and good afternoon, everybody. So really grateful uh, to Career Cert, so very grateful to our great panelists this morning, Virginia, uh, Dr. Jarrett, uh, Captain Caldwell. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, our brand uh, spanking new panelist, uh, Captain Zach Caldwell, I've had the pleasure of, of knowing him for a while, doing uh, some of his uh, continuing education, and now I get to work with him as a colleague at uh, Dallas College, educating the next generation of EMS professionals out there. So Zach, it's a delight to have you here today. Um, Dr. Jerry, I guess, officially has announced uh, to the public he is uh, going to be applying for his EMS fellowship. And so uh, we look forward to having him uh, join the uh, EMS family in Virginia. So very proud of you now that you're in the uh, in the battle in medical school. Hopefully one day you're going to join the, uh, the EMS uh, physician family as well. We're going to be discussing um, a very interesting case today. Uh, many of you, especially those of you in the state of Texas and in the surrounding region, were affected by a snowmageddon, as we lovingly call it, in uh, February of this year. Caught me by surprise, caught all of us um, by surprise, and some of the uh, clinical and operational implications of, um, of this uh, winter storm um, really taught us quite a few lessons, and we want to bring some of these lessons to you today. One of the uh, most important things about EMS and the future of EMS is the integration of EMS into the entire healthcare family. Um, I don't think EMS should ever operate in a silo. I think EMS belongs in the house of medicine. It's always been a house of medicine and its operations in the entire healthcare uh, family really do affect the care that the patient receives at the next 
uh, level in the hospital. So today I'm going to be doing a little something uh, different. I'm going to provide you with uh, just a little bit of an overview of EMS care, but this is going to this presentation is going to guide us through a lot of what happened at the hospital level because some of these decisions were very much affected by EMS decisions. We're going to be walking through the great things that we did, some of the things we could improve upon, and overall I think this is going to be a phenomenal experience for you. As always, we would definitely invite your live questions. If you want to ask a question on air, just put it in the chat. Let Paula know that you want to ask a live question, and then toward the end uh, we will uh, unmute you and you can address us live. I'll be monitoring the chat as well for any not live questions and answering those as best as possible. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to give you some brief information. This call went out uh, as a 911 call for a welfare check came in through uh, police uh, per the uh, apartment manager of this uh, complex and per concerned friends. Um, the uh, patient had not been seen for approximately two to three days. Um, PD and uh, EMS arrived almost at the same time for this one was an weather had a lot to do uh, with that on this occasion. The crew is going to be two paramedics, uh, both of them very experienced and uh, with at least five years of, um, of service for their agency. Uh, one thing to note as far as conditions, um, it was very difficult to navigate on that day and I, uh, Zach and I are, are living proof uh, that getting around in those conditions uh, here where we live, it was, was pretty tough. Uh, hospitals are open and uh, Dr. Jared and, and the rest of our emergency medicine team were ready to uh, receive patients no matter the time day or, or frigid uh, conditions. So now that we set that up, let's go to the next slide, Philip. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, EMS's initial assessment. Uh, so when the police and uh, EMS teams were called out, they were called out for the sake of a welfare check. One of the coworkers of this patient was concerned because he hadn't come into work for a few days. Uh, when EMS arrived, they didn't get a response at the door. Uh, so the Dallas police uh, officers helped by uh, taking down the door. When they went into the uh, apartment complex, they found the patient uh, to be poorly responsive. He was actually asleep at first, but he awoke, in, he awoke to a uh, sternal rub, pretty significant stimuli. After that point, he was noted to be rather confused. He had a little bit of slurred speech and he, they were able to get him up to actually ambulate, uh, but he certainly was a little off. Uh, fortunately, they got an AccuCheck, checked his blood sugar um, on scene and he had a blood glucose of 98. And then because of his symptoms, they were concerned about the possibility of strokes. So appropriately, they went ahead and did a stroke scale, which was positive uh, on scene for a little bit of slurred speech. Uh, he was unable to cooperate with some of the assessment due to just poor understanding and confusion, but they didn't note any facial droop. So they got a set of initial vitals, which are of course always critical to assessing the stability of these patients. Uh, important things to point out here is that this patient is afibrile at the moment. Uh, his heart rate is a little fast. He's tachycardic to 115. He's also a little bit hypertensive to 140 over 85, but certainly not a, a blood pressure that would make us uh, overtly concerned. His respiratory rate was normal, and something quite interesting, uh, considering the etiology of his illness, is that his uh, oxygen saturation was normal, 96% on room air. And then to reinforce, uh, his glucose was normal at 98. Dr. Jarrett, in school, we, we learned that it would be perfect SVO2 100%. It looks like that's not always the case. Yeah, not always. So this is actually one of the more challenging things to kind of decipher. Uh, the reality is that with pulse oximetry, uh, the device generates a waveform that tracks a patient's oxygen concentration over time, but it's, de it's dependent on the regional perfusion. So if the pulse oximeter is placed on the patient's finger, uh, you're taking just one small glimpse at the patient's overall oxygenation status. As a result, pulse oximetry has a sort of normal range. And so anyone who's above, say, 92% and is consistently above 92% and looks well, is not tachypnic and um, is not blue, uh, is not really actually that very concerning for hypoxia. Uh, interestingly, though, this, is one, this particular case is one scenario where we have to be a little wary about what we find on pulse oximeter because as we find out soon enough, 
uh, carbon monoxide can lead us astray when it comes to measuring oxygen concentration using just those pulse oximeter uh, machines. Thank you, Dr. Jared, and uh, absolutely phenomenal to see um, law enforcement and EMS working together to get this patient uh, taken care of. Uh, very interesting for me to see uh, that the initial presentation for, for this patient was completely compatible with either a metabolic emergency or things like a stroke. And the title, of course, you know what this presentation is all about. But Virginia, great question. Uh, uh, all of us learned that in carbon monoxide poisoning that uh, pulse oximetry should be close to 100%. But uh, Dr. Jerry, you're absolutely right. There is uh, some variability, and this threw an additional kind of uh, wrench into the machinery. So let's launch up poll number one. Well, and really my question for you, uh, operationally, where you practice, and again, we're very happy that you're you're here. If you did not know anything about this webinar, you just logged on and you never even looked at the title, you just wanted some some credit, would you have checked carbon monoxide levels um, with RAD57, et cetera, would you have checked CO levels upon arrival? So maybe be honest with, with me and uh, if you didn't know anything else, uh, would it be yes, absolutely, given the circumstances, given the weather conditions and you have a poorly responsive uh, patient on arrival? Yeah, I definitely would have thought of carbon monoxide or nope, I'll be honest with you. I probably would not have, or are you gonna kind of hedge a little bit and say maybe I would definitely want a little more information before uh, checking your SPCO. Um, as we are telling our results here, and we're gonna look at the votes. Zach, give me your your honest opinion. You you practice clinically day in and day out in the field. How would you feel about this question? No, there's there's very little indicator initially for. Uh, putting on the rainbow sensor on the 15s to try and obtain a CO. Um, you know, a lot of times if the patient uh, looks like a duck and has feathers, you know, we, we kind of go down that path. So, I mean, the stroke, the the facial droop, the altered mental status, the, you know, everything that we were seeing, you know, I'd be right in line of, you know, unless, you know, unless you happen to see the uh, a heater or you know something generator running inside the next room there's there's probably very little indication for uh, for us to do that on the front end for this patient thanks zach and uh, i'd be very curious and if you don't mind uh, for our attendees today put it in the chat where you where you come from i suspect there might be a regional component to your to your decision and those of you with uh who live in more frigid conditions um may or may not see this more often Probably uh, the population knows uh, better than than setting up heaters, but here in our region, for sure, there were a lot of folks doing the best that they could to keep warm and and doing some uh, pretty risky things. So, thank you for your uh, answers, Buddha, in your chat. I would love to see where you're uh, joining us from today. So let's go to the next slide and get a little more information uh, about our patient. And Virginia is going to tell us a little bit about the patient's uh, sample history. Um, so this this patient had no allergies we had to worry about, and um, he took a mux, muscle relaxant. Something with that that we need to keep in mind is those can be pretty sedative, um, especially if if they were to take too much. That's maybe a question that I tend to ask when I see that in the med list. He takes a over the counter pain medication for migraine. Not something I'm worried about right now. Um, and then these two medications, Imuran and Humira. Um, those are immunomodulators and just something to keep in the back of your mind too. At this point, we don't really know what's going on. There's so many different reasons for this kind of altered mental status, just acting weird, weird speech. Um, so there's a possibility that there could be an infection and a shock and delirium while on these medications. Um, just things to think about, look out for, try to get more information if you can. You know, I do, do I do want to point out here that the patient was taking an over-the-counter medication for migraine, and EMS ended up eliciting a little bit of additional information while they were on scene, though it took some effort to draw it out of this patient considering that he was pretty confused. And it turns out he had a migraine for the past couple of days, and it was the initial impetus for him to call into work. He'd also been nauseous uh, during that time span, but had not vomited yet. Absolutely. His um, past medical history included Crohn's disease, 
And he thankfully has it under control. His last flare was a while ago. He denies prior surgeries. Um, he's a current smoker, denies alcohol and drug use, and doesn't know the last time he ate. Another thing that, again, we don't know the reason for this altered mental status, but sometimes in the back of your mind, just with anyone, you kind of have to think about maybe alcohol or opiates. Like if he says he didn't, you, of course you want to trust him, but just keep it in the differential diagnosis. Don't rule it out quite yet. Well, can you talk yeah. about some of the complications with smokers? Yeah, absolutely. So the status of uh, a patient's smoking history is actually pretty important when it comes down to carbon monoxide poisoning. The reality is that people who smoke have higher baseline levels of carbon monoxide in the bloodstream. And we'll, we'll actually get down to some of the numbers later. Uh, but suffice to say that uh, in a normal person who doesn't smoke, the carbon monoxide levels in their bloodstream are about one third to one fifth uh, the level of folks who are heavy smokers. And that value and that bit of history can actually impact our decision in the hospital as to whether someone qualifies for treatment. So if their if carbon monoxide level is a little bit elevated, but they are a smoker, it makes us less concerned actually. Thank you, Philip. And as we, uh, like you've been uh, with us for our, for several months now, we've been with CareerServe for several months, and one of the things that uh, you probably know that I'm passionate about is a differential diagnosis, is the list of potential things that could be causing a patient's condition, a patient's appearance, or a patient's physical exam. And uh, today is no, no different. So um, at this point, we have a gentleman who has been missing from work. We had to break down doors. We find him to be poorly responsive with some stroke-like symptoms. And at this point, we don't have a clear idea about what we're dealing with. We certainly, um, carbon monoxide is not yet in our uh, on our mind. So I would love for us to kind of get away from the carbon monoxide um, on a bandwagon for a little bit and discuss really the things that you should be thinking about with patients to show you just how dynamic carbon monoxide presentations can be. So Dr. Jared, can you discuss the differential diagnosis for uh, for this patient? Oh, for sure. So the reality is that the differential diagnosis for altered mental status and some of these kind of concerning symptoms of confusion and maybe a little bit of uh, difficulty speaking, gosh, it's so broad. And in medicine, we commonly deploy an acronym to cover all of the possible causes or the vast majority of the causes that could explain this patient's symptoms. And it is uh, essentially, well, let's jump to it here, A-E-I-O-U tips. It is an exhaustive list. We don't need to go over everything, but some of the really important things to consider um, is one, acidosis. And while we're not really thinking about the pH on scene, what we're thinking about really is the patient's blood glucose and whether it could be sending this patient into diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a diabetic emergency. Uh, we can also have patients presenting with this sort of uh, symptomatology if they have an infection of essentially any source. This is especially true for elderly patients, and they can have very minor infections all the way down to just a urinary tract infection that can cause them to become confused or encephalopathic. Now, this patient is at risk of overdose. They take some pretty interesting medications, and we certainly don't expect uh, our EMS folks to kind of know the toxicology of every single medication, but when we start to see medications with uh, names that are uh, less common, it makes us concerned about whether there's a component of overdose or one of those medications that can contribute to the patient's symptoms. So they are taking a muscle relaxant that could contribute to somnolence or uh, confusion. They're also taking some immunomodulators that can contribute to delirium. And then it's also essentially always on the differential for our altered patients uh, that they might be hypoglycemic, and that falls under the category of insulin. And then the last couple that are definitely big hitters on this list are stroke and shock. So this patient, you know, has all the symptoms consistent with uh, a stroke. They've got aphasia, they've got funny speaking, they might be a little bit confused. We haven't been able to complete it, an exam of their extremities, so there might be weakness that we haven't ruled out yet. So stroke is high on the differential. Getting them to the hospital to get a CT scan and further assessment is gonna be really important. And then lastly, for any patient who's altered or tachycardic, 
a little bit confused, shock is always on the differential. And the differential for that is huge. It can be infectious, it can be cardiac. There are a lot of options, but the, the reality is that we, these patients need to be seen quickly. So you Absolutely. can see I think it's just, yeah, again, really important really important to keep stroke in your differential diagnosis make sure you get that stroke scale but i've had some patients with some strokes that are just weird really weird um and they don't follow the normal positive stroke scale they just sometimes like i've had some that just act crazy and it ended up being a stroke so that's just something to always kind of be watching for or keeping in your mind thank you regina absolutely. you're absolutely right absolutely right uh on all on all accounts um we're going to be taking a look here. Uh, now we got this, the patient, we've loaded him up, and now I want to kind of take you through the next uh, stage of the patient's journey. And I uh, kind of want to take you to the initial notes. We got the straight out of the chart. We're going to be pulling some information directly from the chart here just to show you the complexity of this patient. And at this point, remember, we have no idea about what's, uh, what's happening. So I want to and I, I point uh, to a couple of things that are said here. We definitely have uh, some of the buzzwords here that always concern me about patients when I hear welfare check. To me, that's always a, uh, a clue that uh, I'm dealing with something pretty significant, um, a, sick, a sick patient. Uh, I have some uh, concern here that uh, we're uh, heading toward a toxicity when I start seeing, seeing pinpoint pupils. Um, then you see the differential diagnosis for uh, this amazing uh, nurse. Uh, thinking about infection, like Virginia mentioned, the patient has Crohn's disease. Could he have an infection, an, an encephalitis, uh, a meningitis? We also notice uh, the concerns for the patient's medications, particularly for pain. And we don't know if they're opioids. We don't know if they are uh, sedating uh, medications. And then uh, it's interesting to me um, that we make a mention right here that the patient had um, really has no, no idea what medications uh, he's taking. And even though that doesn't seem like a very big item, this is a high functioning gentleman with a job who takes very few medications and do not remember what those, those are seems, seems uh, concerning. So I kind of want to set the, uh, the stage uh, for you. Let's see what, uh, what we got next, uh, Paula. Let's go through the, uh, the physical exam, actually. Uh, take it away, uh, Philip and Virginia. All right, so whenever these patients come into the ER and we have a really broad differential, we cast a wide net. Our physical exam is one of the most useful pieces of material we can get just straight walking into the room. You know, we order a lot of lab tests and imaging, but a uh, physical exam really sends us on a, on a pathway to decide what the most appropriate testing modalities are. So for the physical exam, we've got a physical exams of both the ER uh, doctor as well as the neurologist who was consulted to help take care of this patient. Uh, and I'm just gonna kind of summarize some of the findings here on the physical exam. And so this patient was not, didn't look like they were in acute distress, meaning they didn't look acutely ill, they weren't breathing rapidly, uh, but they were noted to be dry or a little bit dehydrated. The oral mucosa was dry. Uh, they also had injected conjunctiva or essentially red uh, that were a little bit swollen and red on both sides. Now the heart was uh, with a regular rhythm. It didn't have any murmurs, gallops or rubs, but it was beating fast. And then when we listened to the lungs, the lungs were nice and clear. There weren't any wheezes. The breath sounds were normal. They were symmetric. They weren't diminished on one side. And then we noted interestingly that this patient has a thoracotomy scar on the left side, which tells us that this patient has had a major surgery in the past, something that we weren't able to elicit in our history when we were first talking to the patient. And then when we kind of wrap up our uh, initial exam here, his abdomen was really soft, it wasn't tender, but he also had a laparotomy scar, another scar of a surgery in his belly. Now, when you combine a thoracotomy and a laparotomy, it makes us concerned about whether a patient suffered some severe trauma in the past. Uh, fortunately, his neck was nice and supple. He had good range of motion, things that we think about with relation to meningitis. But what we can really anchor on here is our neurological exam. The ER doctor that saw him uh, writes, quote, that the patient is alert. He has difficulty answering orientation questions about who he is, where he is, what time of, what day of the month it is, or who the president is. 
uh, but he also has an expressive aphasia, meaning that he struggles to pick the words he's trying to say. Uh, and that's what I've been finding in folks who are altered, but particularly concerning for stroke. And then he was able to follow commands and his position was intact. Uh, he didn't have any pronator drift, meaning that when he holds his arms up, one side isn't weaker than the other. His legs had good strength throughout. So this is a, and then a pretty we, intense physical exam. Um, is this just because of this patient, we didn't know what was going on at this point? Is this for every patient in the ER? Um, do they, I mean, should EMS be having something similar to this and therefore the emergency room can catch if something's changed because we've done something like this for every patient? You know, that's a great question. I think that what EMS is doing as far as their stroke scale is really phenomenal. And I think it's sufficient to make a, uh, a determination of whether patients are sort of sick or not sick and whether they need uh, to be taken to a stroke center or a local facility. Uh, but when uh, certainly when we're in the ER and we're operating with little information and we're, uh, we're functioning with a really broad differential diagnosis, the exam is so critical. Uh, what I've described so far in the exam, I would say is pretty typical for patients coming into the ER. Uh, what you'll see here from our neurologist is a little bit more in depth. And so we'll go over just, just a couple of the details here. We won't go through every single item because it's exhaustive. Uh, but the neurologist noted that he was the patient was unable to state his location, didn't know who the president was at the time. His, fleet, his, his speech was fluent, but he did have some difficult picking words, which we call anomia, is another term for expressive aphasia. Uh, he was also able to read, but had some paraphasic errors, which is when you uh, accidentally pick the wrong word, uh, some, usually a word that sounds similar to the word you need to say. And then his memory was intact to uh, his sort of his medical history at this time, but he didn't remember much detail about why he was sick and why he was brought into the hospital. The remainder of his exam, as far as his strength, his sensation and reflexes were all essentially normal for our neurologist. The one thing that they did mention additionally was that he had difficulty uh, with tandem gait where he was attempting to walk. And then he had a little bit of sway when we asked him to stand up and hold his arms out with his eyes closed. So he might've been a little dizzy. Thank you, Philip. Um, as we narrow down the differential diagnosis i want to engage um, let's launch the poll now that uh we're gonna kind of get back into the ems arena so we've given you a lot of information um and once again and i'm gonna engage zach on this one as well if um, zach if you had no idea this title uh, or the webinar or anything about this you're just listening um, how would you have proceeded let's say that the patient presents with all of these exam findings and you did a uh, more than your your fair share of a neurological um, exam. So, uh, what would you guys have done in the audience? Would you, if you're on the yes, I would have checked the carbon monoxide. Yeah, I would have started some high flow oxygen on him. Um, would, would you have transported uh, them to the stroke center and activate him um, uh, out of hospital? Would you have taken him to your closest uh, local emergency department, or do you have a standing um, orders and guidelines uh, to transfer these patients directly to a hyperbaric. So let's see, uh, put uh, your answer uh, there in there. I'll be very curious to see. And Zach, so let me pick on you a little bit. What would you have done if uh, now that you know all of this information? Looking at what he presented, I think we honestly would still have been going down the stroke uh, mediology um, over anything else with Guessing what his C stat would have been, sounded like his pupils were good. Um, he was confused. If he could have followed simple commands, then and he, you know, we're we're able to, to follow commands, do an arm drift, and we probably wouldn't be looking at the large vessel occlusion. So we probably would have taken him to a stroke center. So there's been on the part of town we're in. The closest stroke center is also happens to be a trauma center, on in uh, that has hyperbaric capability. So we may have looked into it, but I think we would have probably withheld oxygen because for stroke protocol and 96 is just where they need to be. So, you know, I think we really been, would have been looking at the kind of the stroke side of it and, you know, at least with the slurred speech, kind of recognizing the potential there and then, you know, bypassing the closest hospital for us, which doesn't have any stroke capabilities and taking them to at least a stroke center, but it would have been a primary, not a comprehensive probably. 
Thank you, Zach. And I think the uh, the answers from our attendees today really reflect the thinking and, and bear this in mind. The, the reason we put a very thorough neurological exam in there is just to show you that uh, EMS, y'all are very well trained. We train you really well. And uh, the emergency medicine physician whom I know uh, personally, uh, absolute, you can even consider him or her a genius, but uh, you know, they were going down the, the stroke route enough to get a neurologist involved and everything. And that's why you have such a comprehensive neurological exam in there. So y'all are really well trained. Uh, quite a few stroke, a lot of you guys going down the, uh, get them to the, to the local hospital uh, route. So very proud to see um, that y'all are, are considering these things. So Philip, let's discuss a little bit about kind of where your differential diagnosis is now that we have a lot of this information and I would love to show our attendees kind of what some of the uh, new information is. Absolutely, so the, the differential diagnosis is a running list of you know our possible options here. And as in the ER, as we get lab results back and exam results back, we start to narrow things down to try to make sense of what's going on with the patient. Now, in this patient's case, based on our exam and the initial vitals, we can already start to cross some things off. So the glucose was normal, so it's probably not a diabetic issue. I don't think there's an issue with insulin, no hypoglycemia, no diabetic ketoacidosis. That's sort of off the list. And then this patient had a normal oxygen level on the on the pulse oximeter and combine that with the fact that the patient's not tachypneic, breathing comfortably, has clear lungs with no wheezes. We think we can cross off COPD, asthma exacerbations, things like that. It wasn't hypo or hyperthermic, so environmental causes seemed less likely at the time. And then epilepsy also seemed uncommon. He didn't have any urinary incontinence or tongue biting that we could find on our exam. Uh, it was also, it, it did seem unlikely that there were any pulmonary causes like hypoxia or tension in motorics because the vitals were so reassuring. And then underdose didn't really seem like an option. The medications he takes in order to cause altered mental status would be would fit more of an overdose picture. And then for intestinal causes, his abdomen was nice and soft. So we were, we were starting to kind of narrow down our differential a little bit. Uh, but certainly stroke, shock, and overdose were on the differential still. So this is a this is nonetheless still a very broad uh, differential for this patient. A pretty challenging presentation, and certainly nobody would be faulted for not thinking about the the correct diagnosis in this patient for quite a while. Philip, um, I uh, let's uh, see this slide on on labs right now. I see quick pull on mine for for whatever. For whatever reason, uh, no big deal if you if we need to reshare uh, the slides. Virginia, do you see the um, does it say quick poll on yours still? It's quick poll on mine as well. Got it. So we'll just look to uh, reshare. And uh, I want to. Well, Philip is doing that. The um, it appears it is during this aspect of the patient's uh, of the patient's care that we start getting a little bit of information about what's, uh, what may be happening. Um, and so right at the, as labs are, are, are coming back, as we start getting a little bit of information from the patient, we start getting some, uh, some results. So Philip, can you discuss a little bit about what's important about uh, some of the studies that we did for this patient? Definitely. So there are so many things that we can order in the emergency room to try to narrow down all of these possibilities. It uh, looks like we'll be able to share the screen now. Is that coming back? Yeah, there we go. Sure is. Uh, uh, so uh, we ordered a lot of different lab tests and almost everything came back really reassuring. Uh, but the one thing that we order for folks for whom we're concerned about carbon monoxide poisoning, at least in the emergency room, is an arterial or a venous blood gas. And while everything else came back pretty reassuring, the one thing that did come back really noteworthy is on this slide, and that's the carboxyhemoglobin level. It just jumps right out at you. It's, it's got the double red arrow. Anything with the double red arrow really catches our eye and lets us know that something's off. And so this patient's carboxyhemoglobin level was 36.4%. The normal range is zero to 5%. So I think we uh, have really narrowed down our diagnosis at this point. Now we can get into the weeds of whether or not the remainder of this VBG or venous blood gas is uh, normal or abnormal, uh, but the reality is that it really comes down to the carboxyhemoglobin here. It should come as no surprise that um, 
one of the main reasons why we decided to get this study is because right around this time we're getting information from the field that um, uh, now the fire department is getting concerned about carbon monoxide poisoning and uh, we're getting various calls from various individuals throughout the apartment complex uh, that are also feeling sick and so this is exactly what we pulled from um, from the chart and just uh, notice uh, some of the some of the clues there that are very concerned edge vac issues to me screaming carbon monoxide poisoning and whenever i hear multiple residents uh, getting ill and i guarantee you the overwhelming majority were experiencing the neurological uh, symptoms similar to this gentleman i start getting really concerned so um, let me pick on zach a little bit zach if you're uh, if you're running this call and you stay on scene as as captain and multiple folks are are getting sick can you talk a little bit of how you uh, operationalize kind of taking a look at these apartment complexes and multiple residents assessing all these dwellings and then getting that in, any information back to the hospital how would you go about uh, doing that sure so we have very sensitive detectors uh, we have on all of our apparatus so once we start to see multiple patients you know i think that that's the the easiest presentation for us one of them to recognize this is you know the present the signs and symptoms of carbon monoxide are very generic as dr jared mentioned so it's the it's hard to recognize from a headache or altered mental status but when we start having multiple people from the complex all having headaches altered mental status nausea um, then that's definitely going to raise the flag for us so we would put on protective gear that's our priority in the pre-hospital setting is protect the first responders so we have the ability to put on air packs positive pressure respirations we'll go in with our carbon monoxide detector or four gas detector and we can check all the apartments we can see where it's highest uh, we can check attics so we'll be able to kind of rule in you know is it the one side or one wing is it the upper floors versus lower floors you know which units are being shared from the compressors from the ac units and then you know we would you know when we've had these in the past we can't necessarily force your way into every apartment to check but if you tell them what you're trying to do you know where where we get a very kind reception from the residents of hey you know knocking on the door hey we need to like to come inside real fast as we're wearing full gear and check your apartment now we've had some you know high levels in other units maybe come in and check your apartment and you know we want to get everyone removed where we see hey have any traces and you know the the carbon monoxide for most of these residents and apartments they don't have gas appliances in most appliances uh, so they shouldn't have any tracing from cooking or anything else so if it's this starts popping up 10 15 20 within a couple steps in the apartment uh, we know we're dealing with some with some problems so we'll we'll get the people out get them removed get them in fresh air and then just start seeing how big of a spread we have with how many units affected and then you know then we'll start getting our rainbow sensor on the life packs and we'll start getting everyone's co levels and start kind of seeing where we need to do for triage and transports. Thank you, Zach. And uh, this was not an isolated uh, incident and never in my career had I seen so many exposures and actual cases of carbon monoxide in my career combined just in that week alone. I saw more carbon monoxide than I had my entire career and definitely EMS was faced with this exact scenario across uh, the Metroplex. Truly, truly impressive. So now, guys, we have a, uh, a good diagnosis on the patient we understand now oh my goodness all these stroke like symptoms and the headache and the nausea and the poorly uh, responsive patient it's all because of carbon monoxide i think we owe it to you to now discuss a little bit about why carbon monoxide does this and even more importantly how we take care um, of of that patient um needless to say some of the things that we did um, in the emergency department were to get uh, the patient started on a um, high flow oxygen uh, delivery system as soon as possible and this is where i became involved in in helping get the patient over to a hyperbaric oxygen uh, chamber and so i'd like to go ahead and, and discuss the pathophysiology um philip a little bit about um about how to recognize it and what our friends uh, in the audience can learn from it today and Dr. Hey. Salabar, it's it's important to note that even the ER with their genius ER physicians, it's the same treatment, high flow oxygen, that any paramedic or basic can do. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> For a diagnosis that's so challenging to make, the treatment is so simple, isn't it? 
let's let's go ahead and jump at some of the details of carbon monoxide poisoning, the pathophysiology, and our approach to diagnosing and treating. Uh, so this young chap here, this is uh, Claude Bernard. He's a French, a French physician scientist in the 1800s uh, who's famous for numerous contributions to the medical field, but one of them was uh, his first uh, description of carbon monoxide poisoning in humans, and he described it as death by hypoxia due to reversible binding with hemoglobin. And he really hit the, really hit the nail on the head there because that's exactly what's going on. So there are a lot of different sources. Uh, from which patients can become exposed to carbon monoxide, but we kind of divide them into three large categories. Uh, the, the three main categories to consider are endogenous sources, uh, exogenous sources, and then methylene chloride, which is like a special player to consider for folks, and we'll get into details as to why that is. So the endogenous source is a bit tricky. Why in the world would we have carbon monoxide being produced by our own body? The reality is it's just, it's just sort of a biochemical byproduct of the normal metabolism of a hemoglobin that's in our body. And any proteins that contain a, he, a heme moiety uh, gets processed in, in the, uh, carbon monoxide. However, this contributes to a very low baseline level of carbon monoxide in the blood. Interestingly, there are a couple of things that can make a, a person prone to have a rise in their carbon monoxide. And frustratingly, these are uh, related to other items that are on the differential diagnosis for people with similar symptoms. So anyone who has a condition that's causing their blood to get broken down faster than normal will have an increase in the concentration of carbon monoxide because more of it's being metabolized. And then anyone with has increased metabolic demand or oxygen requirements in the body that lead to further breakdown of hemoglobin and more production of carbon monoxide. So with our sepsis patients, is this something that we need to be thinking about? So it's certainly something to consider because sepsis is going to make these things worse. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about symptomatology later, but the, the thing is that this is such a challenging diagnosis to make. And oftentimes, if we find any other diagnosis that we can hang our hat on, it decreases our suspicion for carbon monoxide poisoning. So we're really looking for some key factors in the history or details about the domicile that's kind of giving us clues that there might be multiple players involved in this patient's illness. That makes sense. That's interesting that there's it's just a normal byproduct of the body. Um, and so endogenous inside the body, exogenous outside the body. Um, these are some of the, the sources that we see carbon dioxide from outside the body. And I think, again, we saw just a high increase during snowmageddon, um, especially here in Texas. And we haven't, we haven't dealt with a lot of that before. It was, it was something that I hadn't seen before. And I, I saw a bunch of that week. And I think everyone here can say similarly. Um, so just things to be thinking about. Um, as far as outside sources that can cause this carbon dioxide poisoning and these these symptoms, things to be looking for. It's important to observe what's going on on scene, looking around and just taking in all the information you can. All right, I think Philip might be might be frozen on this one. He'll come back in just uh, just a second. I wanted to discuss now that we know the endogenous and exogenous sources for uh, carbon monoxide. Let's discuss a little bit about the symptomatology of um, of carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, and I want to bring your particular attention to a very vulnerable uh, patient population as well. So there are going to be two main body systems that are affected by carbon monoxide poisoning. The first one is going to be a neurological um, effect on, um, on the brain. As you can imagine, as we, uh, as the carbon monoxide is doing its thing, one of the, the items that's going to be the case is that our brain cells are going to start feeling the effect of a poor oxygen um, reception. Um, and so these are the patients that are going to start uh, coming up with headaches. They're going to start coming up with nausea vomiting, vision changes, uh, for example. Paula, let's skip ahead to uh, to the next ones after this uh, and after uh, risk factors as well. We can, we can keep going. And the second uh, body system that's going to be affected is going to be your cardiovascular system. 
when uh, when we're discussing carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, Virginia, we know very well that what happens is carbon monoxide, this molecule is uh, competing very highly with oxygen for hemoglobin reception sites. So hemoglobin carries oxygen to our brain, to our heart and our kidneys. And carbon monoxide has a much higher affinity, a much more uh, a greater chance of binding to hemoglobin than oxygen does. And so all of these uh, hemoglobin module, uh, molecules are just running around looking to carry oxygen. Along comes carbon monoxide. It attaches to carbon uh, to the hemoglobin uh, molecule, and uh, not enough oxygen can can jump on there. And uh, that lack of oxygen is what leads to the neurological and the uh, cardiovascular problems. Uh, Philip, welcome, welcome back. We jump to the uh, the main body systems affected uh, by um, by carbon monoxide. So remember the two are going to be neurological, and then a second cardiovascular manifested itself in things like sureness of breath, sometimes chest discomfort. Uh, patients can have arrhythmias, uh, they can have palpitations, and they can even develop uh, lethal arrhythmias that lead to things like ventricular uh, fibrillation uh, for, for a while. Uh, Philip, let's go back to the, uh, the slide on uh, the vulnerable uh, patient populations, uh, pregnancy, and, and pediatrics, I would like for you to discuss uh, just exactly why these patients are at a, at a higher risk. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for bringing me back in. Sorry, I dropped the connection there. So, uh, there, have we talked about this slide that we're on currently? We decided to jump, uh, jump ahead to the, uh, to the body systems, and we're going to discuss the vulnerable uh, population. Yeah, sure. So there are definitely some special populations to consider. And uh, the reality is that most of our gentlemen uh, are in the population are um, at a disservice because our IQ lacks in, in relation to our female counterparts. That's just something I've come to accept over time. And we're more prone to do some dumb stuff. Uh, the reality is that folks who drink are at higher risk of exposure to uh, uh, toxic levels of carbon monoxide. Uh, and then men in general are considered higher risk just because we're more prone to put ourselves in dangerous environments. Uh, now, we do see a rise in cases in the winter that's kind of exemplified by the, our very own case here. And especially in winter conditions in places that are not accustomed to cold winters, like in Texas, where the our uh, HVAC systems aren't up to snuff to, con to manage that degree of uh, of a cold winter. And so folks often will close windows or will sleep in their cars with the, with the heater turned on and puts them at increased risk of toxic exposure. Uh, let's jump to the next slide though, because there's a particularly important uh, population to consider and those are pregnant women. In reality, it's not the mother so much that we're concerned about as much as their fetus. So when a mother becomes exposed to carbon monoxide, a pregnant woman, um, the majority of their hemoglobin actually, or uh, carbon monoxide gets bound up by fetal hemoglobin in the fetus. It turns out that the fetal hemoglobin is a little bit different from the type of hemoglobin adults make, and it binds to carbon monoxide more strongly, so it outcompetes the mother for that carbon monoxide. As a result, the mother can actually present with very mild symptoms and seem like a very mild presentation of carbon monoxide toxicity, when in reality, her fetus is suffering much more significant toxicity. And it's worth mentioning also that the pediatric population is more prone to developing severe uh, long-term consequences from an acute exposure to carbon monoxide, but they're, they also have the benefit of clearing carbon monoxide quickly from the body after, after that exposure is removed. So when I was being taught this originally, my instructor compared hemoglobin to like a car. And it's ready to carry oxygen, the passengers, um, on the bloodstream highways to a different location, and then it drops the oxygen off. Well, carbon monoxide jumps in the car and pushes oxygen out. So oxygen can't, can't get in the car and um, because all the car seats are full with, with carbon monoxide. And so these tissues, the different areas in the body are not getting oxygen because the car arrives and they want oxygen and all there is is carbon monoxide, which is not what it needs to function. 
That's a great way of putting it. And not only is there less oxygen on board in the car, so to speak, the carbon monoxide makes it more difficult for the other members in the vehicle to get out, so to speak. So whatever oxygen is still bound to hemoglobin isn't able to unload in the tissues where it's needed most. Absolutely. So it's pretty clear, uh, Philip, that uh, we have these oxygen carrying molecules in our body that deliver do the, the heavy lifting when it comes to oxygenation. And all of a sudden they are taxed with carrying this uh, carbon monoxide uh, molecule that is uh, really not doing uh, anything related to, to oxygenation. And um, so not only do we now have body systems that are affected primarily neurological and cardiovascular here, it also puts us in a, a bit of a conundrum here clinically as well. Can you explain to us exactly what this means that, uh, you know, despite levels of, of carbon monoxide, you know, a, a patient may be completely normal or a patient with, um, with low levels can still be very symptomatic. Can you explain exactly why that is? Absolutely. And it actually gets really complicated from a biochemical standpoint. It turns out that anyone who's exposed to carbon monoxide is also probably exposed to some other agents as well that are produced by the same source that the carbon monoxide is coming from. And so people can have very mild symptoms with an alarming degree of carbon monoxide exposure. And then conversely, they can have very severe symptoms with a mild exposure to carbon monoxide. And where we kind of derive the explanation as to why their symptoms can be uh, so inconsistent with their carbon monoxide level has a lot to do with the type of source and what other co-inhalant or co-exposures they experienced on scene. And these are things that we don't commonly test for, but fortunately the treatment is the same. So what we'd like to do is get a carbon monoxide level, but what we need to do is take the symptoms seriously. People with severe symptoms are the ones who deserve um, the most invasive or most significant treatment. We're going to move on there to um, the actual treatment. So uh, let's discuss a little bit about kind of oxygen and, and this hyperbaric oxygen concept. So our attendees today have a really good idea. Sure. So interestingly, the way that carbon monoxide comes into the body is the same way it goes out. Uh, we've got to breathe it out. There's no other process in the body that we know of that helps us eliminate carbon monoxide. So the reality is that we have to help our patients breathe. And what that usually means is giving them additional oxygen. Now the oxygen will become saturated in the bloodstream and kind of incentivize or encourage the carbon monoxide that's bound to hemoglobin to release itself back into the blood in an ionized state which is essentially something that the lungs can breathe off. As long as it's bound to that carbox, car, carbon, uh, carboxyhemoglobin, the hemoglobin molecule, it's more difficult to breathe off. So if we can help unload the carbon monoxide from hemoglobin, we're in a good place. Now, oxygen is the first place uh, we start, and it's the last place we started. It, it has everything to do with the significance and degree of exposure, uh, but what we really care about most is the half-life of the carbon monoxide in the bloodstream, and that comes down to how much oxygen we're, help, we're giving the patients to help replace that carbon monoxide with good oxygen. And so if someone is just on room air, it takes about 240 to 360 minutes uh, just to get through one half-life of carbon monoxide. So four to six hours just to get rid of half of the agent that they were exposed to. However, if we put them on high flow oxygen, oxygen at 100% on a non-rebreather or a venturi, something along those lines, we can bring that uh, high, that half-life down to 90 minutes, a significant reduction, just an hour and a half. Now, where the money is really at is in the hyperbaric oxygen chambers, where we can take it down even further to less than 30 minutes of half-life. And so that's what's really driving our decision to try to get people to hyperbaric chambers if they've got severe toxicity. Uh, there's some debate as to the utility of hyperbaric treatment. Uh, but I think we can discuss that on the next slide or two. Interestingly, the fetal half-life is really quite awful. You know, the mother's got to breathe out the carbon monoxide so that she can take more of the carbon monoxide from the baby or the fetus to get it. It's just a, it's a complicated physiologic process. So the fetal half-life is five times that of the mother's. And then fortunately for kiddos who get exposed on scene, 
their half-life is much shorter than adults. It's less than one hour on my flow. So very interesting to see that uh, we can make a lot, a lot of headway in treating these patients with with high flow oxygen. And and just for for kind of general purposes, remember it's all about uh, that half life of of getting enough molecules out of there at the shortest amount of of time. And it's not going to be a very quick thing. But there are things that we can do to optimize the speed at which we address um, this half life. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about what EMS is expected um, to do uh, in these in these situations. We're gonna skip to the. Uh, let's go back a couple. Uh, actually, um, Zach. We, uh, an EMS for these folks, um, we are definitely going to get a blood glucose for them. Um, would you get a, a 12 lead ECG on these patients as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. The hypoxia can lead to arrhythmias. It could worsen, you know, previous blockages or a patient with angina. And yeah, absolutely. We need to get a 12 lead. Um, if they're having an acute MI, that's something that we need to get, uh, get rectified as well so yeah we definitely want to get ekg monitor and and 12 lead for any patient we're concerned with for co and now that we once we've instituted some of these uh diagnostics and now we have our our diagnosis of carbon monoxide let's discuss one of the biggest operational aspects of this talk which is uh the hyperbaric uh chamber it is uh, my hope that every single uh member here working clinically or in charge of um, of crews on the ground, has a methodology, a guideline to get these patients to a hyperbaric uh, chamber and and get them taken care of. Now, I do have a little bit of bad news um, to bring you, and so Philip, we uh, you and I discussed hyperbarics, and maybe perhaps it's not the greatest uh, thing on earth. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about uh, kind of how we treat patients right now and what the controversy is? Yeah, so hyperbaric, the, well, so the benefits, I guess, of hyperbaric oxygen treatment are debated even among the experts in toxicology. And there are numerous studies that tried to evaluate whether it makes a difference in the mortality of these patients who get treated. And there are some institutions and agencies that recommend treatment with hyperbaric oxygen, and then others that say, you know, high flow is good enough. We don't need hyperbarics because it hasn't been proven to work. It all has to do with how you choose to interpret the literature, the research that's been done to, to measure the effects of hyperbaric oxygen. But the reality is that if it's available to you, and it's available to patients in your area that we might be denying them benefit if we don't consider it in our algorithm for treatment. I think that's an important point to bring up as well. I think all of us work in a, a giant metroplex and, and this is a, a tool that's available. And so absolutely use the tool, but for not everyone has that luxury. And if the decision is between transporting too far away with the hyperbaric chamber, it, it might not be worth it, especially if it's it, if it's controversial among the people in charge that would know and, and they can't even agree. It might be way better to get them to a quick, closer, fully capable of handling everything else that might come up with this patient, including MIs and everything else that low oxygen in the body can cause. That is a healthy way of looking at it. I think if you're able to take care of the immediate life threats, the arrhythmias, um, for example, uh, the ischemia, then, um, and you have a patient who still is showing significant neurological cardiovascular signs of carbon monoxide toxicity, then get them to a hyperbaric uh, chamber. Uh, we have one question before we, we close is, uh, did the original patient present with any unusual skin uh, coloration, especially pink uh, skin? You know, that's a phenomenal question. Um, none of it is documented in the EPCR, uh, from the medics. I did see the patient personally, and when I arrived in the room, I noticed nothing out of the ordinary except a gentleman sitting there very quietly um, and uh, was frankly confused, but I did not notice any unusual skin coloration. Now, granted, by the time I got involved, it was probably about 10 to 15 minutes after the diagnosis was made, and he had already been started on high flow uh, oxygen. So 
Um, that's a phenomenal question. You can't see uh, skin uh, discoloration in these patients. So uh, we're wrapping up here. I would like to thank uh, Virginia, uh, Captain Caldwell, thank you so much, and Dr. Jarrett. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again. Uh, thank you to CareerServe for all of their time. And uh, one, uh, we're going to make one quick uh, plug for uh, making sure that you remember that carbon monoxide toxicity uh, can be accompanied by cyanide toxicity. And your agency should really consider um, getting kits, even in your supervisor vehicles, because these cyanide toxicities are absolutely deadly, especially for uh, EMS professionals and uh, firefighters. So do consider that. So thanks again, uh, everybody. Paula, thank you so much. Clayton, really appreciate you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Salazar and team. Thank you for bringing this very interesting case to our audience. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And remember, if you want to earn CE hours, just need to be on the lookout for an email. You'll be receiving it in the next 48 hours with the exam. Just make sure you complete it, and we will just report the CAPSI um, CE hours directly to them. So no need to do anything else. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining. And if you need any other free resources, you can just feel free to go to careersearch.com. Thank you, everyone.